gotta go around. Oh. Red Ryan Museum is like a church. Okay. You walk in, I've never seen a museum. <laughs> Hello, my name is Angelica McGee with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Today is July 26th, 2022, and I am interviewing... Rick Ramey Lesur. Would you mind spelling your name for us? My first last name is Ramey, R-A-I-M-E-Y. But the family, my family and my history I'm talking about today is from the Lesur side. L-E capital S-U-E-U-R. Okay, and uh, we are in Holly Springs. Okay, so I'm Sebastiano Coco. Uh, Willett Hancock. And Adolfo Romero. Okay, so. Um, so when and where were you born? I was born here in Harley Springs, but at the time it wasn't uh, incorporated yet, so it would be considered Holly, uh, Marshall County, but I was born at Holly Springs Hospital in 1976. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so it was, I think I was one of the first uh, children born at that hospital at the time. And do you have any siblings? I do. They were also born here? Uh, yes. How many? Two. Two. Yeah. Okay, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your education? Did you go to school in this region or where yes, did you go I'm to school? Product, I'm a product of Holly Springs High School. Um, long, I never went to any other schools here in this area. I'm a uh, ordained minister, um, graduate of Brewster Theological College in Memphis. So a uh, two year college degree with, uh, in ministry. Uh, but for the most part, just self-taught and uh, hands-on guy. All right, perfect. Uh, good to hear. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, uh, about Holly Springs? What makes Holly Springs special? Uh, Holly Springs has two different, and I have to use that for lack of another word. It has two different elements to it. Um, it's the historical from a antebellum standpoint, I'll use that word. And then there's the historical point from uh, sharecropping and, 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 and um, family life like that. So it was two different dynamics in Holly Springs. Um, and it still reigns today, kind of, uh, and for the most part. It, you know, so um, in, in this area where we are doing the interview, uh, they used to have uh, what they call the um, Pilgrimage, I think, uh, Antebellum Pilgrimage. They hadn't had it since um, maybe three years, uh, but Mr. Frank Sward was over and involved in that a lot. Um, he's one of the lifelong residents here. He's since passed away. Uh, but so they came, a lot of people would come to Holly Springs to view the uh, large houses like the Walter Place across the street and um, a lot of that, but the majority of Holly Springs is a Afro-American uh, um, dynamic. So you have two, like I said, you got to, so that's why you have two different dynamics and mindsets. And they are uh, more so like hardworking people that, that try to have stuff and provide for their family and get their family, because most of the families in this area were made up of between 10 and 20 children. Wow. So yeah, yeah, yeah. On that side, of it. so so it, it, with my Lasua grandfather um, and his family, it's uh, I can't count half of them that live in this in this in this area still today. But they've since a lot of them branched out. But um, could you share more about the land um, that your family owned throughout the generations and things? Yes, yes, I can. We uh, I did some research on. Uh, my grandfather's parents and I couldn't find a lot on them but for the most part the Lesueur family tree when it comes down from them they all went into buying their own property between um, like the 1930s to to today 
So if for uh, the majority of them, they still own property in this area right now, uh, as far as the Lesur. But my grandfather's name was Matt Lesur, and he would say, uh, say it, it was T. Matt Lesur, just the letter T. Matt Lesur. Um, that was what he said his name was, and that's where he would spell it. And the way I remember when the exact day he was born, he would say it just like this, and it, for him being born in that era, I get it. He would say, I was born June 12th, 1905. That's what he, he wouldn't say, you know, like 1905, he said 1905. And I was sitting and listening to him talk for hours about it, but he, in 1953, they moved from I think it's the Lenati farm area out in the country because they were doing sharecropping and stuff at that time. And he bought the property right here on Center Street, which at that time it was Route 5. And then our address was like Box 4B. So it wasn't a part of the city yet. It was like right outside the city because Holly Springs stopped right at Hillcrest Cemetery going down Center Street. And so it was all county still. So they were in the county. He bought uh, 20 acres there. And from 1953, he uh, worked the land and, you know, started his family, well, had his family, and he raised his family there, all of the sons. He had, I think it's like 13 or 15 sons, but oh at, yeah, and then three daughters uh, total, yeah. So um, they, they, and, and um, the majority of them grew up right on that property there. Um, and the older ones got married and moved off, and as the younger ones, the younger ones were still there until uh, maybe five years ago, I bought the entire family out of the property, so I'm the sole owner of the property now. Yeah, yeah, so I'm trying to restore it and get it back to its heyday, and I'm, I'm torn between whether I want to do like bed and breakfasts there in honor of them and name each one of them after the children, or um, just um, rent it out as a, you know, just a month to month thing. But um, next year, it would have been 70 years that it's been in my family, which is my grandfather and then to me. It changed from my grandfather to his children, uh, which was seven of them with a name on the deed from that, from in like 98, I think, or 2000, somewhere in there. And from that point, uh, we went through some eras where I ended up buying them out to keep the property. They Nobody wanted to pay the, to be responsible for it. So at the end, I said, you know what? I'm not willing to let this go because he fought like everything to uh, make a home for his family and to show them how to be owners and stuff like that. So to just let it go like that after he worked all those years and my grandmother her name was Susiana Hughes Lesure, his wife. They stayed together the entire time. And matter of fact, it's an article on them, uh, I think it's in the South Reporter archives. They were the old, the longest married couple in Holly Springs for wow. a long while, yeah. So I'm not sure if they still hold the record or not. So yeah, that's kind of, did I answer that? Is that? Yeah, okay. that's a really good answer. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. Can you tell us how, how your grandfather acquired the land? Like, do you know, like, did he work? Did he save up money? Or how did he kind of come around that? I mean, yeah. that's a lot of acres. Yeah, <laughs> a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, yeah. And it's actually, that's actually like a smaller plot because his cousins' um, sons, they bought like 150 to 200 acres on the other side of Holly Springs. But they had more siblings and stuff. Okay. Uh, and, and so... Uh, it would have been his brother's children um, that own property on the north side of Holly Springs right now. They still own over 100 acres over there wow. now. So, but my grandfather, he didn't go in with his family. He just bought his out. I'm not absolutely sure, but I know that it involves sharecropping. sharecropping. And so he, uh, at that time, that, that's where they started at. So I'm not, I hadn't found out all that information yet, but I'm working on it so that I can next year honor him and my grandmother for that you know, and, and, and still being in that property, still being in the family. Um, what were some of the most memorable stories you can share from your grandparents, like from either uh, personal experience or them telling you stories? Uh, well, my, my, my grandmother, uh, 
I have to give you this. My father was 42 when I was born. So I was, so my oldest cousin, is, her name is Janie, which is his granddaughter. She should be in her 80s now uh, or, or somewhere in that, or thereabout. But I'm 45, about to be 46. So I was like the youngest of the older grandchildren. And uh, I uh, was like her pride and joy, my grandmother's pride and joy, I guess I would say, because all the older children would say that my grandmother was mean and she did a lot, you know, she would whoop them and, and all of the whole, whole nine and she didn't play with them. And some, one, one of, I think it's three of my cousins say that my grandmother shot them in the tree. They were getting her peaches and she shot them with salt shot out there in the tree because they were up in her peach tree getting the tree, getting their peaches. So I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. My grandmother would never do anything like that. You know, that was my girl. Uh, but she um, was the was the matriarch of the, of the family. And what she said when she was up and around went. My grandfather and my grandmother stayed together the entire time, like I said. And, it's hard to find longevity like that um, now in our society today. But my, they showed me what it is to go through pitfalls and ups and downs and hills and valleys and, and, and still be like, hey, my family, are you still my family? I'm still here for you. I'm still going to make sure everything's okay in spite of all the other stuff that we went through, you know. Um, so they... My grandmother, when she was younger, cause she had started having many strokes as I got older. So my more memorable times was when I was like less than 10 of her being mobile. And she would always say, come in here and let me show you how to cook. So if you get married to somebody that don't know how to cook, you, you won't have to worry about that. And I thought that that was one, but both my grandmothers on both sides did that same thing. They shared all of their knowledge. And my grandmother on my mom's side was my mother, you know, because I stayed with her more than, you know, just between them two and my grandfather. He never did I see him angry, I guess, to a point to where he wanted to, you know, do uh, harm or, you know, get out of control. I'll use it as that and when I was young, you know, uh, he, he was just the glue. He, he, I think he didn't have to fight to make, you know, his voice heard. He just, when he said it, they did it. If they didn't do it, you know, I don't know what happened. <laughs> so, uh, but they, he would, uh, like I said, sitting and talking with him, he would tell me mem his stories about his mother. That's how I know what my great grandmother's name is. And her name was Martha Jane Cheers. Um, and I'm not absolutely sure about his whether it, whether it was his his grandmother or great grandmother that it was during the world wars one of the world wars that the son one of the sons went in out in the field in an area where they were having a battle at and he found a military shell uh and he the unexploded and he came to the house with it and uh was in the house sitting and looking at it and he said that uh, my grandfather, well, his, whether it was a grandfather, a great grandfather, was laying in the bed with his wife. And he woke up and saw him holding the thing, holding the uh, unexploded device. And he said, What are you doing? Get. And he threw it in the fireplace and ran out of the house and it exploded and killed both of them. Wow. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So that's one of his stories that he would tell me, my grandfather would tell me, but I, because I was so much younger, I remember the story, but I can't remember whether it was his, his, his mother, Martha Jane's years, or one of his grandparents. Wow. So, yeah, so, and I hadn't been able to find any history on that. So, so that's, you know, but I know it was in one of the world wars that that happened. And uh, so just, I would just sit and talk with him about stories um, of, of how he lived and stuff like that. Just, I loved it. I love sitting and listening to him tell me stories. He um, told me of another story and, um, oh my God, I can't think of his name. The gentleman that home we're on in at this point, we were talking about um, Flick Ash and them from Pasta Camp. That way, my grandfather used to walk back when he was younger from there 
to Holly Springs from Potts Camp and Hickory Flat and stuff like that. That's where they were the mode of travel, more so if they didn't have a horse and buggy or something like that. But it's a bridge right before you get to uh, Potts Camp. It's a long bridge, and at this time it was an older, rickety bridge. They've since replaced it. But he told me uh, he was walking from Potts Camp coming home, and my grandfather was maybe six foot seven. He was a tall guy. Both my grandparents, are, uh, my grandfather on both sides were taller gentlemen. And he said he got to that bridge and he was on the bridge and a group of uh, Caucasian guys came upon him on the bridge. And they was calling him boy, you know, because that was the norm and uh, what do you think you're doing and, and where you going? And they decided that they was going to throw my grandfather off the bridge into this river, uh, the Tallahatchie River. And he was scuffling, you know, and, and then scuffle ensued, and they had him, was getting ready to throw him over the bridge. And he said some other Caucasian came onto the bridge, just happenstance, and said, y'all let that boy go and leave him alone. And he said they opened their hands, and he said within two, when they opened his hand, he took two steps, he was across that bridge, and he, he ran all the way from Potts Camp, all the way home to get him, to, so they couldn't catch him. To, to do him harm. So so those are some of the memories that he would talk about, you know, things like that uh, that happened to him in his lifetime. But God still smiled on him and allowed him to live till he was like 98 years old. So, so yeah, so those are some of the memories that, uh, from that part, from, from the two of them. Uh, so. It's certainly quite powerful. Um, something that I was wondering about is you said that you've gone to school here all of your years, like elementary, middle, and high school. Mm -hmm. um, and so naturally, like growing up as a child, like you're being exposed to so much in the family, family history. Um, what was it like in early school, especially with teachers, were the teachers also connected with the community? Did you also get this kind of history at school or how did mm -hmm. that go about? Yeah, and that's what um, I, I'm very adamant about the education of our uh, African-American children in this city now because it's, the school that we go to now is basically 100% African-American at this point. And I feel that they're not getting the education that they deserve. Uh, with that being said, when I went to school here in my younger years, everything that I didn't get was because I was too hard-headed to get it. It wasn't because it wasn't available. And the community was different. It was the family unit because everybody that taught here lived here and knew everybody that lived in this area. So if you did something wrong, then they would just say, I'm going to tell your mom, I know you, I know your grandmother or this and you should, she wouldn't approve of this. And you would try to squash it to keep it from getting to them because they, they had a no nonsense type of thing. And, um, uh, in that era, you didn't have to ask permission to discipline somebody else's child. They did it, and then they would discipline you there, and then they would you get home and get disciplined again because they were more involved in seeing you evolve and grow into a productive adult uh, back then. So now I feel like in this era in Holly Springs, and, I, and they are just basically getting a check. Uh, you know, they they doing it for. Uh, experience to grow and go to other areas. They're not staying here. Um, so the, 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 the school system is, and I'll say it to the superintendent or whomever, that the school system is subpar in this area. Uh, and I was, and I can say that validly and, and, and boldly because my three older children, I have um, six children total, the four of my own, and you know, so a family mixed together. My three older ones graduated from Holly Springs, and I never felt that they were prepared for the world that we live in. Uh, they graduated um, and went to uh, uh, own in life, and they do it well, but they're not where I wanted them to be because I wanted better for my family, just like my grandparents wanted me to be a step better. And I stand on the shoulder of giants. I didn't realize it at the time. I just thought, hey, this is my grandmother and my, you know, but 
I stand on the shoulder of giants that, that you know, wanted to see their bloodline go on and be productive and positive and, and a light to this community and the world that they wanted. So um, I was forced actually in maybe six years ago to move my younger children out of this area into another school system, uh, which is the Soto County school system so that they would get an education that I thought they deserved. And I didn't want to do that because I was uh, actually parent of the year here in uh, Holly Springs, uh, being so involved in my children's academics and, and uh, athletics and all that stuff. So they honored me at being parent of the year. And I made a statement that we didn't need to build a another junior high school that we needed a uh, new high school out in an area where it's away from the landlocked area that it's in now. And I was ostracized and criticized. And they were like, "What? why would you say that? You know, I'm like, it's true. We have children skipping school and doing everything. You know, it's, it's, if you go into the school system now, it's not a good school system. It is not. The, the superintendent, found me walking, I was going into the post office one day, she stopped me, she said, the super, I'm talking about the superintendent, she knows me. Uh, she taught me in school. So she, yeah, she was one of my teachers in school and I love her, you know, I still love her today. It's nothing personal, but I think that we are failing a generation of children. And um, she stopped me and she said, come here, young man, I need to talk to you. And she said, uh, <laughs> I said, uh, yes, ma'am. She said, uh, they told me you making statements about we didn't need to be, I said, I did. She said, oh, you know, <laughs> you, 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 you don't understand what's going on. I said, I understand very much so, you know, because I'm there involved and I see what comes home to me, you know, and uh, I see what goes on when I'm over there. And she was like, I said, you have children. I said the same thing. I said, you have children skipping school and being gone for hours and nobody knows that they're gone or cares that they're gone and they come back with their leisure and nobody knows what's going on. And I said, I'm not telling you this because uh, I've seen somebody else's children, but it happened to my daughter. My daughter was skipping school and off with boys and this and that and other, but I took her to school or put her on the bus and that's where I expected her to be. So if something drastic would have happened, uh, then she, would, she cut me off. She said, listen, them children were skipping school to go get lunch because the food is not good. Let them children skip school and go get chicken. That was the end of my relationship. That was the end of my uh, even trying to fight for that school system. That was the defining moment. I begged God, God do whatever, get, help me to do whatever I gotta do to get my children out of this school system. Uh, you know, and they, and they were skipping school, doing everything. I was making a point that if she would have died or somebody would have heard her, um, somebody come knocking on my door talking about, well, we have your daughter over here in a hole, a ditch or something dead. And I'm like, no, nah, my daughter's at school, you know, but in all actuality, she wasn't. She was doing whatever she wanted to do. And it still goes on a lot today, you know, um, uh, and, and I still don't approve of it. But to show you the difference, and I apologize for this long, no, but, no, please. Uh, once I was able to get my children, my younger children into DeSoto County Schools, it was like night and day difference. Um, here, they make you line up and go to the lunchroom and all this stuff. They got you in uniforms. And, but when you go into the school system, it's so loud. It's just, it's just all chaotic. And, but the uniform is supposed to make them, you know, positive. Uh, I took my children over to DeSoto County Schools. They don't, you don't have to line up to go to lunch. You come in, put your stuff down, and you go to lunch on your own. They teaching them at a young age, this was in kindergarten. Uh, the first year uh, when they were in kindergarten, when my son, youngest son was in kindergarten, he went, they would you know, just show them the ropes. But then every year since then, they, they, hey, you are supposed to be responsible. They let them go and, you know, up and down the halls as they, you know, they're supposed to be responsible enough to go on their time and come back and all of that. And when you walk into the school on any given morning, there are, it's a 5A or 6A school. 
and I can still talk to you just like I'm talking right now. It's just quiet. There's no uniform policy. It's only a dress code of, you know, be respectful, don't wear any gang affiliated stuff like that. So it's a totally different night and day thing. And then if they, if your child is late to one class or another, you get a text to your phone. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I was like, that blew my mind. And I was like, every hell and high water I had to go through to get them over there, I still appreciate every bit of it today. It was worth all the hell I went through, all the ostracization, all that. So, um, and that's because of Matt and Susie uh, Lesur and Ethel Mae Ramey. That's my grandmother on my, that's why if you see on my hat, it's Ramey. I, I can dare honor them without honoring her, the queen of the Ramey clan. So. Uh, those people instill that in me to still have family values and family, and they would tell you who was a solid type of family or what family you associated with, and they would also tell you a corrupt type of family. So that kind of kept the dynamic together uh, with, uh, you know, within the community here at the time. So it's a big difference now, uh, and I hate it. I hate it. I really hate it that we're in the dynamic that we are uh, now. I think you're, you spoke a little bit on uh, the way that back in the generations ago they used to be a little bit more, you know, sturdy on the on the children, yeah. and nowadays, you know, more leniency. Yeah. Uh, and I think that translates back to the values yeah. and today the way that they behave. But can you tell us a little bit about other changes that have occurred um, in Holly Holly Springs and how it has changed? Maybe from the time you were a kid or your generation or your parents' generation all the way till now? What are like big major drastic differences you've seen in the town, whether good or bad? Uh, the good, it's kind of hard to find Aww. right now. The, the good part about it, you still have a unit of, of people that know each other, but you have, uh, different beliefs and different opinions that cause more of a divide now. Uh, you still have that. Um, the divide is wider it was, and it all revolves around um, the political field. But in this community, less than 8,000 people in this city, it should not be this divided as, as it is. It should be uh, a team of people working for an ultimate goal to get the children educated, to uh, make a better home life. And then because of the divide of uh, uh, the Democrat and Republican and all this, all the stuff that's going on basically in the world is going on right here in the, in the uh, city of Holly Springs, more so. So with us being divided, we when you divide, you conquer. And so because people are so divided, you don't know when right in front of your face, you're losing the elements that made this city what it was. You know, um, like Holly Springs is the county seat, uh, and um, but and they had a lot. Like you had to come here uh, to get uh, the Social Security office was here. Um, there they they had the first one of the first Hollis hospitals in this area, so a lot of people had to come here. It was a lot of stuff that was here in Holly Springs that has since gone because nobody was on the same page to say, hey, we don't need to be losing this, we need to be adding to it. So um, if you go to any other county, any other city around here, all of them, Tennessee or Mississippi, because you got Collierville and all that to the north, you have New Albany, you have Oxford, you have uh, even now Bahia and South Haven, Olive Branch area, they have superseded us because we're in our own way. We're in our own way. We're, we're fighting a battle with each other that we shouldn't be having to fight because at the best, we're all in the same boat and we stabbing holes in a boat that we all riding in. And what's going to happen? I sink. We're going to sink. Um, would you ever run for office? <laughs> Your local office? <laughs> I actually... Uh, that's, that I actually signed up to run this past oh, time. Wow. And um, for whatever reason, like I said, divided. I'm not a one side or the other. Uh, other or, I, and I say what I mean and mean what I say. So uh, I was considered one of the biggest threats at the time. 
And so some of the other candidates got together and challenged my residency. Uh, yeah, they challenged my residency. And uh, I, I proved that I lived in the residence, but they got me on a technicality. The technicality is two houses on each side of the street. On my family property, right here at the heart of everybody in this city knows me. Everybody in this city knows who I am. If you say Rick Ramey, anybody to anybody in this white, black, or other, they know me. From the bank presidents to the attorneys to uh, doctors and lawyers, all these people to the people in the alley, the the winos and all that, they know me. So they know I'm a product of this city and I'm a uh, element. So they, they got me on the technicality of saying, okay, on my driver's license, I have 507 South Center Street, but I live in the house my grandparents were living in until they died because it was a better house. My dad and I moved across the street on the same property. And it says wow. 502 South Center Street. So they say, because I, and I have my tax paperwork and stuff going to 507, which has been my address my whole life. It belongs to me, but the house, they are directly across the street from each other. The street was put in after. This was just a road wow. to my grandfather's property. Uh, he owned everything in there. It was a dead end. It was no through street or nothing. And so that's what they got me on. I, and I thought it was laughable because all the people that got together to put uh, pressure on to keep me from getting in because they felt like I was the biggest threat. Not one of them made the cut. There you go. Yeah, so I'm like, and they, and now they're crying about what's going on in this city. And I'm like, hey, y'all didn't want to go before. <laughs> so will I run again? I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I will or not. But I still believe that Holly Springs is a jewel and a gem that's hidden in the rough. And if we can get out of our own way, we can evolve just like every other city, not to lose the antebellum, but um, uh, not to lose uh, uh, the old houses and the, the, the unit of, you know, knowing everybody, but to grow this city into what it is designed to be. It's a beautiful place. I, I appreciate the architecture and things like that, but I know who built it. The, this stuff was built on the backs of my ancestors by force, not by choice, for free, not for pay. So I know what, and when I look at it, I say, hey, wonder did my great grandfather have something to do with that? And uh, uh, so I'm not against this. I'm not against the, the old style and all that, but I just believe that because of this old style, they need to learn how to coexist rather than still be fighting uh, because it, I was talking with one of the new directors, and I don't know if I should say this because that's my opinion, but I'm, I'm not afraid to say it. You know, um, he came in, he came from Punatop and they, for the county. And we were talking and I was just telling him some of the same things. And he said, you know, I don't know why this city is not honoring what they have and really using what they have to uh, build uh, uh, and make it more uh, attractive. And uh, he was going on, he was just saying, there's so much stuff here. And he went to this antebellum side. And then the next thing he said was, you got five Confederate generals buried in this graveyard that they should be bringing folks here to see. <laughs> you want me to Agree with you on that? No. Those five Confederate generals was fighting to keep my generation, my family, my bloodline enslaved. I just think that there would be a lot of irony in you guys making a lot of tours and profit off people wanting to come see those people. Yeah. That's my only aside. Yeah. You know, so, I... so and, and you know, I'm not against their history or whatever happened. The history is history. But don't you and, and you trying to convince me, yes. a black man, yes. to go with you on the Confederate side when this city is 90% African American, that's not gonna work. Mm -mm. We got we if we 
I'm not saying take away anything that has been done with antebellums and this and that and other, but the behind the big house thing was the closest thing that we got to uh, share in the black experience of Holly Springs in a positive light. Uh, other than, and that's why from 1953, that's why I want to honor my grandfather and grandmother because they said, hey, we're not this. We're not less than. We can have ownership and property just like anybody else if we work hard. That's what we should be looking at. The, you know, I mean, in spite of all the adversities that he went through, he was still able to raise an entire family of children on a 20 acre property that was trying all the while being closed in on and trying to be taken from one person or another. But by the grace of God, he still, the property is still in his bloodline right now. Uh, and, 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 you know, so, uh, that's that's the biggest divide uh, from what's going on in the city. And then between that, you have the older uh, African American patriarchal society that is very resentful of that fact. Like I said, this is why, because I'm, I'm like right at the cusp of where time started to change the bicentennial, you know. So a lot of stuff was changing. The older generations. Is still resentful of a lot of the things like stuff like if he would have said that to uh, oh, an older person yeah, yeah they would have probably came and glued you know uh, but I'm like okay that's what that's your belief and that you know uh, but I I know there's not where in the younger society that wants to go into the future technologically uh, they like gung-ho so because they have no voice here as soon as they're earthly possible able it to they get out of here they gone we all of the quality children that we have and we do have some some very smart children that were raised right here in all this spring very smart children that uh if they would have had the same opportunities as other in communities would probably be at top tier so if for them to get where they want to go they move texas atlanta uh, all the bigger cities, uh, uh, some have even migrated all the way to Washington State, uh, you know. And, and so that's what I was going to say earlier. The educate from the education standpoint, the stuff that I didn't get uh, is because I didn't want it. But the stuff that they want now, they can't get it here. Yeah. That is not here. It's not a place for it. So uh, I've I've been able to weave through a lot of stuff and provide for my family as well and still be a product of this community while having to buy a house in Olive Branch, uh, pay a mortgage up there in, 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 in a house that I've never lived in, wow. never spent one night in it, just for my children to get the education I think they deserve. And from the two standpoints, those three uh, narratives, prime example, my older son, he's a truck driver, but he went to Ole Miss and he couldn't perform because he was overwhelmed. He was overwhelmed in an educational standpoint, but he walked on as a red shirt at Ole Miss. He red shirted because he was so athletically fit, and but he couldn't keep his academics up because it was not instilled in him. My youngest son went to Center Hill in Olive Branch from, first, from kindergarten. They tested him in third grade for spotlight and IQ accuracy. His IQ level is 125. So he's in spotlight and they were like, well, y'all not gonna have a problem with him. Right now at his critical thinking, he can decide right now whatever college he wanna go to in the country on a full ride scholarship based on him. And he's just now going to sixth grade. So he reads books and uh, things, you know, and I was, I was so, that's, that right there is enough for all, like I said, all the stuff that I went through to find out that he's going to be able to go. That's what I wanted for every one of my children. The same thing anybody else wants for their children. Give them a fair shake. Let's see how things work out. Stop trying to keep us down. Stop trying to keep, you know, uh, us divided, all this stuff. We're dividing ourselves and conquering ourselves. All right, thank you for sharing that. Uh, going back in time uh, to the civil rights uh, era time, 1960s, mm -hmm. uh, do you remember any stories or anything from your parents t talking about it or were they part of any of the movements? My grandfather, as far as 
outwardly, he never really discussed it a lot. They didn't get active in it because it was so quick, <laughs> working so much, uh, trying to keep what was uh, theirs um, that, you know, and they knew then that if they caused a ruckus, it would cause more trouble for them, I would say. So on both sides, like I said, the family, my grandfather on this side, the other family on the west side, or the east side of Holly Springs and the north side, they kind of just stayed out of it openly because of the flick ashes and, and people like that that were manipulating a lot of things. Uh, you know, with um, the coming by the election time and giving watermelons out for a vote, you know, uh, giving you a shot of uh, giving you a half pint of liquor for a vote. So it was being a lip, uh, manipulated to the biggest point of it. And so um, with me standing, I got involved. Anything I want to know about, I get involved in. I get involved from the bottom and just work my way through it to find out if this is what's really going on or not. And like I said, where I am now, I've seen a lot of things. Um, that's why I'm still a voice crying in the wilderness and wanting to see this community move forward from where we are uh, uh, because of that. Uh, so they knew just wholeheartedly that they couldn't be the voice that I am now. They couldn't, they wouldn't have sit and said this to anybody to, for it to be played out in the open because it could have caused them unwanted uh, stresses and things like that. So with my grandfather having a uh, having that property down in the dead end, it's one episode that they talked about a lot. Uh, my cousin at the time, Holly Springs, was predominantly Caucasian at the time. Uh, it was more Caucasian when they around the time of integration and stuff like that. And uh, this particular cousin of mine um, said that uh, a Caucasian girl said that she would kick him in the butt. And, um, and he was like, no, you won't. And she kicked him. And when she kicked him, he turned around and kicked her back. And it escalated from school to a group of uh, Caucasian getting in a truck and coming down to my grandfather's property down in the dead end. And they pulled, it was at night and they came down and they were saying uh, that they was gonna kill all the N-words and they were gonna eat all of them and this and that and other. But because that era down there was all of him and his children, it didn't go like they thought. So that same cousin, they all were in trees and stuff out in the woods with guns. And when they came down and did that, the cousin got up and fired the first shot. And they shot at them all the way until they left from down there. Uh, and they were screaming, they shooting, they gonna kill us, they gonna kill us. And that's how they built a reputation <laughs> when you go down and uh, they call it, uh, let's see, what, what was it? Some people called it Lesueur Valley. Somebody called it, um, uh, yeah, that's what Lesure Valley and Lesure uh, Cove, that if you went in there, if anything happened, not one, one police wouldn't come down there. It would be a whole line of them because they knew there were so many of them and they were all one unit on one page. You, they, didn't, they didn't come out and get into a lot of stuff involved in the city, but you didn't go down there and mess with anybody without getting the full grunt of what was going on down there. So, so that's uh, some of the stuff that, you know, in, in, in memories um, that, that happened. So and that's another reason, like I said, because it would cause them to, they, I guess, and I'm, I get it from them that they are no nonsense. They take no prisoners. If you disrespect us, <laughs> you know, you're going to get what you get. You know, uh, so. Um, another question, uh, going back to that period of time, but, or even in the 70s, I'm not sure if any of that happened, but uh, with the Klan, was there any anything around this area, Holly Springs or nearby Holly Springs that you remember uh, uh, passing by or? Well, um, Holly Springs was a slave auction city. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. They were auctioned slaves right on the courthouse. 
right there on the courthouse steps. And uh, I'm not sure of the, uh, what the era that it stopped because I've been so busy trying to keep up with my family ancestry at this point. But my uh, father then told me a story about the clock in, uh, um, in the courthouse. They didn't, the clock never worked in the courthouse because they said that they hung a black man in that courthouse and he said that this clock would never work. Uh, the clock has fell out of the ceiling in the courthouse. That clock is always some issue with that clock, but they hung a black man in that courthouse. And that was my father and grandfather knew about that story. So um, I'm not absolutely sure if my grandfather was born a slave or not, uh, because 1905, you know, 1905, it was uh, uh, kind of, you know, still some stuff going on, so I'm not absolutely sure. Uh, but those things kind of, with listening to those, to those stories, it kind of shapes your, you know, view of what's going on. They, like, you know, make sure you cover when you go places, and, but for this reason. But to openly say that I ever remember them saying anything about a clan coming to there, other than that era uh, situation with the carload of uh, Caucasian coming, I, they didn't, I don't think, I think they had a different type of reputation. Right. So, you know, uh, but now from my grandmother's, uh, and I actually, when I did my ancestry DNA, I actually found them, uh, that one of my grandmother's brothers supposedly murdered a Caucasian because they were in a fight and he was trying to do something to him and he murdered him and he, when he murdered him, he just left. He left and they don't know where he went. They couldn't find him. They, they knew what happened, but he just left. And when I did my ancestry, I found out that he ended up in Knoxville, Tennessee. Wow. So, and the way that I found it was through DNA and they were like, they, he, as long as he lived, his children say he never would uh, marry their mom. He never did anything to put his name on roll or anything like that. And he died up there and they didn't know anything about where he came from. And so when we did the ancestry thing, that's how we found out that that was his bloodline is up in Knoxville and uh, up there and they're in, their names are, uh, oh my God, I can't think of the name, but they have a totally different name than the Hughes side. So. Uh, that, so that's, that's some of the things that I've learned. By any chance, do, while doing your research and DNA, ancestry and so forth, have you been able to contact any of those members, extended family members I have. at this point? I and have. what do they say? Does like do the stories align yeah, with, yeah. with everything they, they're saying? Mm, and, yeah, they say it. They, well, they, they, they sure did. And they, we actually discussed it. They, um, wow. they, they, they tell me, you know, we talk through text and, uh, and emails and some of us on the phone. So. Uh, yeah, so they, yeah, it lines up. The line, they they said they don't they didn't know anything until ancestry came. Yeah, and they did, and a lot of them did their ancestry, and it tied them right back to us. And that's yeah. Can you tell us uh, what that means to you now that you're able to find? You know, you're doing your own research. You're going talking to extended family members. What does it mean to you personally doing all this? Um, I actually, I, it makes me proud that that in spite of all the stuff that went on, they still were able to. Uh, uh, produce and, 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 and be active and we, we don't have a reputation of crime syndicate or stuff like that. It's always been something positive or just I'm going to live my life and make sure that my children live that life. So it actually makes me proud to know that through all the stuff, through all the adversity down through the years of history and stuff like that, that we're still here and I'm one voice that's crying, saying, hey, I'm standing on the shoulder of giants, you know, because I was, you know, born free, but my grandfather or my great grandparents were born slaves, right. you know, uh, you know, that, that's, that, that's uh, mind blowing yeah. that, you know, I can go when I want to, I can, and, and my children don't understand any of this. Cause my, my son, um, he asked me one day, I, I've not taken the mailbox down that had my grandfather's name on it at the house that we were living in. He, he was born when we were living in the house. Uh, 
uh, before I'm, I'm divorced and stuff. So you hear me say that we were living in the house that um, we were uh, uh, born, that he was born in. He was walking one day and we were out in the yard and he was like, Daddy, who is Bat Lassure? And I'm like, you never heard me talk about it, but I've done it so much that when he came along, I wouldn't, you know, I was working more. So I, I didn't realize I hadn't explained to him. I'm like, that's your great grandfather. But it also, he never got an opportunity to meet my father. And uh, because my father died when my daughter, my youngest daughter was uh, nine months old. And so he got, but the older children remember my father. And he cherished them. My father was a hard, you know, rough exterior type man, but he cherished me and my children. You know, he he would, I mean, tote them when he would tote them when they were bigger. He would still tote them like they were just precious cargo. And he did me the same way. So I remember that I was still sitting in my dad's lap when I was thirteen. You know, and, you know, so me, I, me and my dad was, you know, up until he passed away. So uh, and I, so I started telling him about things and they on my property I'm working on it cleaning it up and it's a spot on my property and for whatever reason I just feel so connected to this part when I'm stressed or burdened or 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 whatever I just go up on this hill and I stand and it's like I get clarity about what my goal is what my purpose I just stand and look at what I'm going to do next and my son walk up he said why do you always be standing off in places like this and he he very inquisitive. So to, with a lot of the challenges that he had back then, I mean, you know, the, he would challenge my thing. I would say, like, if I would use a certain word when he was younger, uh, like a plethora or something like that, he was like, what that mean? You know, he never wanted me to just go past we, I, everything that I would say. He always very inquisitive about it. So I had to take time to sh go back and break down things about uh, who these people were and stuff like that. Because like I said, I was the younger of the older with the 80s and you know 80 year olds and 70 year olds and 60 year olds all of those uh really remember my grandparents but after me some of the young ones don't have any uh recollection of these people uh, so yeah and uh, um so speaking about your son um there's a term you use was it flick ashers um it's flick, it, his name his meant. name is flick ash the guy uh he's he was a uh he was a uh politician uh, uh, so you know he would manipulate things to go his favor and one of the things is that uh, I-22 corridor that y'all came through was not supposed to go through Potts Camp it was supposed to go through some other area um, it was supposed to come through the Holly Springs area more but Flick went in and gerrymandered and bribed and did a lot of things to move the way the corridor came through. So that's why uh, I-22 ended up going through Potts Camp. Just like I think they did the same thing with uh, the 269, uh, Highway 269 here in Bahia was not supposed to even come through Marshall County, but they went and did stuff to manipulate it to get it to come through uh, Marshall County because of a commercial industry and the industrial community. Yeah, so. So that those are the type of things that go on that behind the scenes that you never know. Um, like I said, the from my grandfather's uh, property, none of that was in the city. But when they found out through the IDA board, seeing a lot of people in this area don't even know what the IDA board and uh, go what what it's for and intended for. So they had they planned stuff twenty and thirty years ahead that you never know. So my grandfather's property was in the country, but when they found out that the highway was coming, they went and annexed Holly Springs all out there that put my granddad's property right in the center of all of this. So I can take you to the property right now, it's block, two blocks away, and it's still like I'm standing in the country because my grandfather's property, but on all sides is uh, warehouses and highways and restaurants and Annabelle and home that and that's what I that's why I was running for Ward 3 I was going to run because it it covers the whole gamut of what Holly Springs is commercial industrial uh residential uh and tourism all of that it has parks and it, it, so I, I know what it could be if done right and fought for right but we we still 
we can't get out of our own way and we fight too much infighting. So uh, that that uh, that's just a, a snippet of what is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so many people left in the 20th century because of <laughs> the conditions. Mm -hmm. What do you think uh, your family decided to stay here for? What do you think drew them or kept them here? Uh, just knowing where they were, and that's when I have to go. When you ask that question, all of them didn't. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 1973, I was not born yet. Uh, when I when I went back and did the history, when they were selling the tracks that my the property that I'm talking about right now, they were in square uh, uh, tracks. Mm -hmm. It was just if you go back to when my grandfather bought it in the, in the courthouse, you can find the map that show that the lady was selling the property in 20 acre tracks, square tracks. There was no streets going into there. It was just all, bless you, uh, it was all square tracks. So from the time that he bought it, it evolved into almost a circle. And, but at certain points, if I lay that map to what I bought over the map to where my grandfather bought, you will see that a certain part of it lines up with what it was when he bought it. But through uh, white privilege, uh, folks said that they, certain parts of their property, my grandfather's property was their property. And in 1973, then they would get to, and back this time, they didn't have permits to build houses and things like that. They just would get stuff and build houses. Uh, my grandfather, them, they lived in three houses on the property of their own. The children would build them a house, and they would just move out of that house into a new one. Uh, so they, yeah, so all of them did that. Uh, all the houses that were there, the children would just build them. My my oldest uncle, uh, his name was Lonzo Lugasor. He uh, worked for the county, and he um, so he did the road grader. He was driving the road grader and all that stuff. So they all would get the stuff and they just build a house. So in 1973, the boat rights uh, challenged uh, my grandfather for his property in court. And the house that I was born and raised in was kept because of adverse possession, because they could prove that they had been living in the house for more than 10 years. But my aunt's house had burned in the spot that I'm telling you I stand in, uh, and she had, they had built her another house right next to where I was born. And because the house hadn't been there over 10 years, the judge deemed it not a part of the property. And so they gave it to the boat rights. But um, I also find evident, found evidence that they sent her a summons saying, if you want to challenge it, you could come back to court and challenge it. But at that time, a lot of stuff was going on. So I had maybe five uncles that had moved from here to Milwaukee. And so when all that stuff happened, she packed up her family and moved to Milwaukee. And I got cousins up there now that have never even been here. Um, from That was 1973 before I was born. And what the boys did, my youngest uncle was getting ready to get married or whatever, they went over and tore that house down, moved it across the street and built it back and it still sits there today. Uh -huh. But when, you know, in certain happenstances, my uncle died um, from cancer young. He was the youngest of them all. He died young, he was married, they had no children. When he died, his wife family, you know, I mean, his wife inherited the property as per law. Uh, but it was my granddad's property, but he had gave my uncle a little spot out so he could have the property. Um, when she died, her family went and got a quick claim deed and sold it to another gentleman without even consulting the family and saying, hey, did y'all want to get y'all family back, uh, property back? So it's a property sitting in the pro inside that property that I own everything around that another man owns, and I've been trying to get it back from him. That's bizarre. Yeah, yeah, but that's the law. If that, that's just, that's what it is, and you have to, is it right? No, because, you know, uh, but, and he, he, he won't sell it to me. I've been, or uh, let me have it back. You know, I've been trying to get it back. I've been, but I might not ever get it back. But the same token, another spot right beside that spot, 
my other aunt passed away and her children inherited it and they refused to pay the taxes and it was lost. But I was able to buy that spot back. Oh, wow. So I got it back, but it's another spot on the other side that my other uncle didn't build a house on, he just left and he lost it. Somebody said he sold it. I didn't find the evidence of how it got out of his name and guess who owns it? Where I started from, Frank and, uh, Fr uh, Frank and Vicky Schwartz, the millionaire of Holly Springs owned that property and I've been trying to get it from them for the longest. So they just paying taxes on a piece of property that's sitting there growing up for years and I hadn't been able to get it, get it finalized and get it back from them. So that's why I was trying to restore it back to the way it was and I don't know if I ever get a chance to or not because of a lot of stuff that I have going on personally. So. Your kids will one day. They ain't, man. They, they gone. <laughs> they gone. My oldest son lives in Texas, and the rest of the children, they going. They, they going to do just what everybody else has done. They not fighting for the history, the future of Holly Springs. They fighting for their own self-preservation and their, their lives and their livelihood and their family. So, and you can't be mad about that. You know, you just have to, uh, if you're not willing to wait on, and be methodical in getting to see what I'm trying to see, then I can't be mad at them for that. They, you know, they doing the same thing. And it's, uh, it's not just a Afro-American thing, it's a Caucasian thing too. Because they not, they like, hey, I'm not gonna keep harboring some, a lot of the children are not, uh, uh, Caucasian children that go right here to Marshall Academy are not willing to still be uh, racist, Racism is a smile. It's a word, you know. Uh, carry on that that mindset. They want to live and let live. And I go into other communities. I was in St. Louis over the weekend, and I went into a, a brunch place, and you see every race of people in there just co uh, co mingling, and it's not don't you know they we not you know all that stuff. And it is, it's, I'm pretty sure it's, it's there, but that. In Center Hill, you have that same thing. You have Muslims and uh, Mexicans and Latinos and whites and blacks. It's not a reigning white or black. And that's why I love Center Hill for my son to be like one of, one of his classmates. He came home, he said, Daddy, I'm learning Arabic. And uh, I'm teaching my Arabic friend uh, uh, English. And I'm like, all that, that little stuff is worth it, you know. Uh, and I know he'll probably, once he gets, once he graduates, and if he goes to one of those Ivy League colleges, I highly doubt he's coming back to here to, to care about any of this. So, uh, and I, like I said, I'm not going to stifle him. Uh, my, my oldest son has been in the military. He uh, did a tour in Afghanistan, so he's uh, retired. I, he, he got out, he been, he's, so he's an Afghanistan vet. He was in Bagram, Afghanistan. He had came home maybe six months before they had this suicide bomber drive up to the gate and, and explode the, uh, and kill a lot of the Americans there right before they pulled out of Afghanistan and all that. So he was, he was some of the last ones to be there. And, and so he's been around the world. So he's definitely not trying to come back. He, I, I tried to get him to come back and be a police officer. He's like, I'm not coming there. So, yeah. So there's uh, something that uh, kind of came to mind where in a previous interview, we did speak of the show homes mm -hmm. they have throughout the city and obviously who built them and not just that they built them for free, mm -hmm. but then they service and keep them up, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yet, I mean, I've very few places I've ever seen that have this many houses still mm -hmm. standing right next to each other. Mm -hmm. And we were saying that really speaks to the genius. Mm -hmm of these folks and yeah. same with your family so one yeah. thing that really comes to me is do you think that because i grew up in a town of three thousand people is the big town big town around so i'm very okay. much rural you know okay. okay and it's something that growing up where you always want to go out like kind of mm -hmm. like you're saying if you're, yeah. i'm right here my hometown is 5500 miles away you know okay okay I'm a long way away from home and so i think what really would um I think was really important is for people to like people don't realize how good they actually were doing all this thing so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i just wonder i mean obviously you're really hands-on like do you think there's a way to get kids that 
reps don't want to do all the tech and don't want to do all that stuff to still be grounded here and get them to do things that would maybe feel more valuable you know is there is there a chance for that do you think yes yes very much so very much so it is that's what i'm saying we're missing the big picture uh, we're we keep building uh, low income housing low income housing breeds low income thinking sure. you know if you don't if you don't ever put uh, income housing in here but now here's the thing not only did my son do it Everybody that I've talked to that has taken their, ch their child or children out of Holly Springs and put them in DeSoto County School goes from a failing, not able to read, to excelling and able to read. What's different? Thir 20 minutes. What's the difference? The mindset. The discipline. The involvement. Until we change our mindset in the way of big eyes and little U's, who, how many people do you know that the superintendent would have got out and came and said that to them? The superintendent of the school system finds one parent to tell them that, that they shouldn't be saying that. But they know that it was true and they didn't want it to be. They know that it was, we missed the mark again. We missed the mark. Every time we get right there, we missed the mark because of own self-interest. We keep shooting ourselves in the foot. You know, uh, schools, if you look at it per uh, the, in the society we're in, where you got school shootings and stuff like that, uh, a person can get onto the campus right there because of all those houses, old houses, and go in and, and kill up a, a thousand people because it's in an area that you don't know where the threat is coming from. Per the children getting off campus, you don't know when they're gone, when they're back, you know. Uh, so you look at most schools now, and that's where Center Hill is. Center Hill is out in the back, in the boonies. It was out there by itself. They just started building warehouses across the street from it. But you couldn't, if you didn't know that Center Hill was over there, you never would know. And they are a blue ribbon school um, last year from for one of the top tier schools in the entire country. And it's a public school. Yeah, it's a public school. All you have to do is live in the area or work in the, work in the county, and your child can go to that school. Uh, and not only is it in Hill, but Lewisburg, um, DeSoto Central, um, uh, those schools are all top-tier schools. If you Google the top schools in, Marshall, in, uh, in Mississippi right now, Center Hill and Lewisburg is going to be in the top 10 every time, every time. They not doing. They, it's not a different set of people. About thirty to fifty percent of the people that left here went to Sunny Hill. Same children, different environment. If you change your environment, you can change the way of thinking. You can let them see a different way. Uh, we need, you know, we need more affordable housing. We need more, uh, uh, more people going out to court the businesses to come here. So um, you have. Uh, an industrial park over on the west side of town that we in board meetings arguing about whether we should or shouldn't put in a uh, sewer system to the restaurant with a man that is a millionaire that owns the steakhouse saying I will pay up to 500000 wow. to get the sewer system put in because I need the sewer system and then annex me into the city so I can get liquor license and not have to pay a, um, a resort tax. All the tax that revenue that he's making on that property does not come to the city or the county, it goes back to the state. But if Holly Springs annexes that into the city, all that revenue is an instant boost. The racetrack is right outside the city. All that revenue that they pay in tax revenue and alcohol, liquor licenses and all that goes back to the state. All Holly Springs had to do is one thing, sign on the dotted line, the stuff is already done. But to convince them, uh, the powers that be and leadership that we need to go forward is like night and day. You got the mayor that's sitting there, my cousin, I love her, smart girl. 
so far off base is unreal. Their thinking is, how are you going to get some other stuff when we got all these other things in the city that's broke? They don't go hand in hand. You still got to repair the sewer inside the city limits, regardless of whether you build a new sewer outside the city limits. That's expansion. That's moving forward. That's They're getting ready to build a 500-plot um, subdivision to the south of Holly Springs, right in the annexation spot. The county going to get the taxes. They're building a 550-house uh, uh, subdivision right at the end of Red Banks Road. It's in the Holly Springs school, school District. You have a failing school district that's building houses up there, four and $500,000 homes. Do you think they're going to bring their children to Holly Springs? Not going to happen. So if we work on getting the school system back up to par and work on expanding our city and work on getting commercial buildings and things like that and office spaces and all that like everybody else is doing, you got to be proactive and not reactive to whatever's going on. That's a proactive move. The, the annexation, it might not change anything right now, but 20 years from now, supposing they build a subdivision out there right on that same part of the thing we're arguing about in court, uh, I mean, in the, in the board meetings about, and in court, about annexing that part and putting in the sewer system, all that is, you, you, you're charging them for it, it's going to pay for itself. Water running out of the water tower has nothing to do with, one has nothing to do with the other. You got employees riding around not doing what they're supposed to do and stuff like that. You got to change the people. You don't stop growth because that, that's not, it's not feasible. And, you know, some of the uh, wealthier people live right outside the city limits. One gentleman snubbed his nose. At, he can't stand me right now. If you come to a board meeting, you'll see him. If, he, if annexation comes up and I come in and I say stuff like this, he cannot stand me. He moved outside the city limits. He going to snub his nose at the city to say, I'm not paying no city taxes. He put his house right on the county line, right there. His backyard is 10 feet off the city limits. And he comes to every board meeting and fights the annexation that's going to go way past him to get a whole subdivision simply because he snubbed his nose at the city and was and going to be slick and put his house 10 feet outside the city so he has city services and don't have to pay city taxes. That's the mindset. That's what you got to change. They annex me. I'm paying city taxes on a property that I'm paying 15. They annex my grandfather way past him. He didn't. That's growth. We still got to pay the taxes. We still got to do. You you want everybody life to stop because you snubbed your nose at the city because you were mad years ago. That's 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 insane. You know it's crazy. Ten feet. You moved outside the city. Ten feet. If you didn't want to be a part of the city, why didn't you just move on out in the country? And then when they annexed, you had no dog in the fight. But you're gonna show them. And now since he's been outside that city limit line. For so long, his children have bought houses out there, and their homes value at one hundred eighty-five to two hundred thousand dollars homes. So, if you go look at the dynamics of, Mar of Marshall County and Holly Springs, the most expensive house inside of Holly Springs would probably be the Walter Place or, or Montrose, Antebellum Homes. That's million-dollar homes. But other than them, other than these Antebellum Homes. The medium income, the medium value for a home, a three bedroom, two bath house in this city, $60,000 to $100,000. Not gonna work. Not gonna work. You gotta step back, look at the big picture, like I do on a daily basis. I even check myself am I going the wrong way? Do I need to change? Is it something I need to change? Am I, you know, so that until we start checking ourselves and see what we, but I mean, I'm explaining this because y'all are not from this area. It's black and white, right? Yeah. Not to them. Because real quick, like something, so in uh, cities in Florida where we've been to, um, a big thing there has been that sort of the decline of things is, mm -hmm. um, you know, the neighborhood schools, especially a lot of the neighborhood businesses, mm -hmm. you know, they 
a lot of times like took him out like all mm -hmm. the they really messed up the city mm -hmm. right here it's a much smaller reality mm -hmm. it just sounds like they just Same can't mm -hmm. push it forward though it's like you can't like it's like you it's, there's no mentality of like handing it over right right to mm -hmm. the future if that's mm -hmm. the case because otherwise what are you going to do it's gonna right right that, uh, until you lo loosen the reins and listen to a new voice could you imagine if the superintendent would have came to me and said, young man, what do you mean? And now, I, because I, I've been wanting, she, she sensed, and I used it. I told people that I want her out of office. I want her out of the office, but with powers that be keep appointing people that keep reelecting her, reappointing her every time. I want her out of office. That doesn't mean I hate her. I, you're just not forward-thinking superintendent. I want you to understand what we're doing. And she she uh, came back to me years after, because I would tell anybody that would listen to me what was said. She said she saw me years later. I, about It was probably right before COVID. Right, so probably two years ago, I was detailing the car at the bank, and she drove by, and she saw me, and she let the window down. And she said, young man, come here. Same thing. She said, uh, she said uh, um, I, I want you to explain to me what, what your uh, reasoning is for saying some of the stuff. And I found out that you mad at me uh, about a conversation that we had. And you said that I said that you went, uh, let them children skip school. Uh, they ain't doing them going to get chicken. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe I said that, but I want to apologize for anything that I said that might have been offensive. And I want you to help me to uh, try to rectify some things in the school system and, and, and help me uh, come out and help me with certain things in the school system. Um, and she said, I never, I didn't even go into the discussion with her about it. Uh, she, she was talking, she said, but I want you to know that I apologize if, for, for offending you, if I offended you or whatever. But I'm like, I'm thinking while she's apologizing to me and I, like I said, I hold Ill, no ill will for it because I did what I needed to do for my children. But the children that can't afford to do what I did are being failed. I didn't stop working in this community. I still coached um, Pee Wee football up until COVID. Uh, I, I would, you know, try to inspire boys to be stand up men in school and all that, in the school system that they're in. They go, most of them go to the school system. So with my son, I, I didn't want him to lose all the values of Holly Springs. So I kept him involved in all of the athletics here uh, as far as playing football and stuff like that, you know, um, going to robotics camps, whatever I, that was going on here, I kept him involved in it, but he had a different education. That's what I didn't want to, I, I shouldn't have been forced to go buy a house and not live in it for an education of my child in a solid place. I could have took that money and invested it into the school system, but I'm not putting my money into the school system as one parent and you're going to take my money and do what you want to do with it and not do what I'm going to see done. See what I'm saying? So I, I would rather pay more taxes here to get better teachers. Uh, than to go buy a whole nother house and pay a mortgage and all that to get my children into a different area, out of the area that I know and the people that I know and the people that I love, the, the, the lifestyle that I've grown accustomed to. Everybody doesn't need to leave this area. We need quality people here just like we need anywhere else in America. So until we get out of our own way, we're going to continue to decline. And my point, the reason that I found out later that she came back and apologized to me, she had been manipulating the numbers for years from come, when they switched from Common Core to, um, I can't think of the other name of the uh, program that they used in the Mississippi now because I've been, you know, uh, but it was from Common Core to Star, Star Reader or something like that, whatever it was, it was two different programs. And she would manipulate the numbers to where it always looked like the school was meeting the criteria for passing and, and being a passing school. They were passing with a D rating or a C rating. When they switched to common core, switched back to this other curriculum, uh, as soon as they did it, it dropped and they went to F rating. I said, now y'all see what I've been telling y'all the whole time. The mayor came back and said, Rick, you was, I, I've been 
I've been fighting it. The mayor, previous mayor, I, I was telling them years before I left, but now here you are coming back to me. Five years later, after I done put my children into a school system, we got teachers coming to me saying, Rick, you need to bring your son back there. I wouldn't bring him back here to save my life. I would No, I would refuse to bring him back to this school system until it is set up in a way that I can see the growth of a child the same way that DeSoto County is doing. And they, well, we're not in DeSoto County. Exactly. We're in Marshall County. But they got a pretty good blueprint. That's right. Is it, just, just real quick, is it, What's the situation there? Because you said, I think the school was kind of built, the, the one that's like the better school in DeSoto County. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one of those things where they're built sort of isolated, but mm -hmm. what's the, is there like a smaller town too around there? What's it like in terms of, compared to Holly Springs, you know? Uh, Olive Branch was smaller than Holly Springs. That's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. It, years ago, Holly Springs had the social security office. They had the, uh, uh, DMV, I mean, uh, the driver's license department, all that stuff, they had to come here. And in the infight in here, we lost all that stuff to DeSoto County. And now DeSoto County has superseded Holly Springs mm -hmm. to where it's uh, the fastest growing city in, the, in uh, Mississippi at this point. And almost like Las Vegas. It's, it, they built my house, the house that I bought to get my children into the school system, tripled in value in less than five years, in less than five years. And I've never spent a night in the house. <laughs> so my thinking was, I'm a critical thinker, and uh, what a lot of the families were doing, they were going over in this apartment complex called Annandale. And they were going in and renting apartments in Annandale. And when they, ch they to put their children into the school system, they would put them in there, and when they would get out of school, they would just go there and wait for the parent, whomever, to get off, and they would come pick them up and bring them on home here. People still live here. Uh, and I'm like, eh, I just can't see fattening a frog for a snake. I'm going to go rent a house. Apartments rent for 900 to uh, 1500 Why would I do that? When I can go over, buy me a house, and all of that money that I'm putting into it is all an investment so that when my children graduate, I can sell at home and get every dime that I put back in it, uh, plus the profit and the growth and the, uh, you know, all that. So that's what I did. I just refused to go over and just give away my money. Yeah, I was going to say you maybe you didn't sleep and not in the house, but you got plenty of a good night of sleep yeah, from yeah. knowing. Exactly, <laughs> <other> exactly, <laughs> exactly, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, we've been almost, I think, by, for over an hour, or we're still uh, around? Hour 20. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we're going to wrap it up, but there's a couple questions before we, okay. we okay. wrap it up. I'll be sure this uh, yeah, No, yeah. no problem. Yeah. No, no, this is really good. You've, uh, I think you've expanded our mind on Holly Springs. You know, this is the real talk, you know, yeah. like yeah. we do hear a lot about today. We have heard a lot about the history, yeah. but not in current times. Like what is going on right now? Yeah. And I think you're kind of, you know, yeah. saying it how it is. Yeah. It is yeah. what it yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, so I know you were running for political, you know, office or running um, mm -hmm. recently. But uh, can you tell us maybe a little bit about organizations that you're involved with? groups that you're involved with in the communities? And, well, yeah. uh, I was part of the mayor, um, the mayor of the advisory council. Uh, I, I was a lot of that. I was, uh, every, I was a, like I said, I was a solid parent in the school system. I'm a part of the uh, Holly Spring Mustang coaching team. I was a part of my lodge, my Powell Chapel Lodge, number 339. So I, I'm in, I involve myself in, I in, I in, in a whole lot of things in the city, uh, whether it be for me or just for the city in general. You know, uh, for and I'm not when I say for me, I mean it involving my family, yeah. regardless of whether they're in it or not. I'll, I'll support it. I try to support positive thinking from wherever it comes from. Now, well, you know, I, I understand y'all might have um, the the the, the Deberry family. Um, one of the prominent families around here, I try to support them. The Lester family, they do um, like fishing. Uh, one of the ministers, Rod Lester, uh, uh, he does a lot of, uh, well, he was at one time doing like teaching gun safety and stuff like that. And I was always, you know, I'm supportive of whatever goes on when it comes to broadening the mind of a child. So, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, second, well, I guess second to last question is, I think when you came in, I heard uh, Reverend, are you uh, Reverend, right? Michael. Okay, yeah. I, I want to talk a little bit on that end. Uh, what religion do you follow? And, um, and yeah, how involved are you? How did it, how did it get to that point? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I was um, called into the ministry in 2004. Uh, I have since, like I said, I am, try to hone my craft and make sure that I'm doing what's right and trying to lead somebody in the right way and telling them. Um, I, my father, the home church, my grandfather and my great grandfather, all were members of Free Branch Missionary Baptist Church and uh, they're out on Higdon Road. Uh, I think even my great great grandfather is buried in the original cemetery of, so it, I've always been tied to Free Branch and Rising Star. That's where my family migrated from. That's where they migrated when my granddad bought his property, he moved from out there to where we are now. Uh, um, but that the Free Branch, it was a missionary Baptist church. I was baptized and b raised on the Baptist, uh, missionary Baptist uh, teaching. Uh, in my studies and in, you know, uh, I went away from the missionary Baptist mindset. Uh, you know, just like the city, we, we they get in their own way. You know, you you it's our way or the highway. And then in church in general, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, uh, Episcopalian, Methodist, uh, Baptist, uh, Muslim, uh, Buddhist, whatever it is right now, we're stuck in a place and we can't even see it. We're stuck between 1950 to 1970 in every teaching that they do. Everything else around the church well, whoever it is has evolved into the new millennium. Nobody church you go to right today pulls up on a horse and buggy. Nobody church that you go to right now uh, come in with their coveralls on. and uh, No church you go to in America goes, to, but they stuck with the teachings of 1950 to 1970. They just, my grandmother did it this way and this way it's supposed to be done. We're supposed to do it. That causes the same thing in this city. Uh, the same thing that's happening in this city is pushing all the young people out to all this new quick uh, technology. I mean, and understanding it, different mindsets that are being taught wrong. And it's causing a lot of walking away and falling away from the Christian belief or, or whatever belief. It, 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 until we get back to advancing our buildings and advancing our teaching, we got to start working on the minds. Showing, look, that's why a child. 15 years old or 16 years old, able to take an AR-15 and go into a school or a grocery store and shoot somebody because they have no idea what it is to love somebody that you don't even know. Some, they have no idea what it is. Why don't they have it? Uh, because of GTA. It's children right now, five and six years old, sitting down in front of a TV screen with a remote in their hand playing Grand Theft Auto, and they showing prostitution, rapes, murders, all that stuff on the TV. It's whatever you see and it, whatever this, I was thinking about this earlier before Wayne even called me, um, that our eyes, and our, some people call them windows, but they're hallways. They're hallways. They're hallways to the soul and to the heart. Whatever the eyes see, it retains that. It goes into that, whatever you get in it, because uh, right now you got people watching P-Valley, this new thing, and y'all might not know about this. It's, why do you have to be so graphic and showing the intimacy of uh, between two men? Why is that? You don't have to show that. But people are, it's, when they sit there and watch it in their screen, they're going into their hallway, right into their DNA. So all that, whatever they see, that's what they're going to do. At some point, it's going to change the mindset. The stuff that we see, we used to protect our children from certain things. Now we expose them to everything. You got two year old and three year old with a device that can he can turn it on and talk to people on the opposite side of the earth. Somebody that could be a positive person, could be a negative person. How many in y'all just y'all uh, access right now? How many y'all find somebody that you don't know on the internet being positive? Many times. But but how many? Not he said not very often. But how many a time do you find people trying to scam you, trying to get money from you, trying to manipulate your mind to think
think a different way and and and, and mess with your mind. That's where you got stuff. You you got all this stuff going on while the church still sitting there saying the Lord gonna fix it. Jesus said, greater works will you do that I've done. Jesus' whole ministry was in a three mile to six mile radius. But here we are on the other side of the earth having a conversation about Jesus. That's what you gotta be. You gotta be a light in dark places. You gotta be a voice in quiet places. Were your parents, did your mom and father inculcated um, the religion or were they religious themselves or would you go every Sunday to church or how was uh, that? Mm, my dad didn't. Okay. But my dad influenced me. My dad didn't go to church as uh, much as you would consider. My dad, when he was a kid, he was holding on to a horse's tail and the horse was pulling, you know, how kids get into stuff. And he was holding the horse by the tail and the horse kicked him and kicked his brains out. And so my grandmother had to get him and hold his brains in and take him to the hospital. And they put two bull dollars in his head as a metal plate to put his brain back in. It didn't affect his thinking, but it started making him have epileptic seizures. And even until he died, he would still have them from time to time if he didn't take the medicine. And I was there with him sometimes when he would have a seizure. And um, so he, his fear was that he would be in front of somebody and have a seizure. So that's why he didn't go to church as he, you know, a lot of people. But my grandfather and grandmother were very religious people and they instilled it into their children. So my mother and my relationship has always been torn. Uh, we've never been that close. When the times I did live with my mother, um, she went to church. And this is the thing. A lot of people that go to church, church is not in them. My father didn't go to church, but church was in him. Because he did more when we was laying in the bed at night and teaching me how to pray for this person and that person and teaching me what it is to pray and why we do it. Then my mother going to church, doing a lot of things that were ungodly and stuff like that. So uh, you have to, uh, when you ask me that, it's a loaded question. So, uh, but, <laughs> but, so, but then you got my grandmother that, well, my mother's side that stayed in my ear with, you know, do right and other people right. It's just right to do right. You know, and we, when you get a child, if you, if you had a child and you teach them all the time, it's just right to do right. It's right to help somebody when they down because you never know when somebody gonna need you, you know, help you or need, you gonna need somebody. So uh, those things, and for the most part, the values were taught, it kind of ended around my era. So it went from, you know, respect this person and be nice to this person or, or love this person, even though you don't have to deal with that person too. They better not touch my baby. You know, they better not say nothing to him. My, this is my baby. You don't, don't say nothing to him. So they get one aspect, one, one idea, one ideology. Whatever they see, that's what they're going to regurgitate. That hallway is going to bring back right. what they were saying. Okay, uh, last question I do have. Uh, this is regarding, we talked, and we've been asking this question uh, to a lot of the um, community members today. Mm -hmm. And this is in regards to a law or bill that recently passed on one of the streets that was named uh, Memphis. <laughs> and right now, I know they're fighting to move it to Ida B. Wells. Mm -hmm. It passed. It did pass, mm -hmm. yeah. I was there. So can you tell us uh, how did you feel about the whole thing, the process, and the decision now? Uh, it, it's going to take longer than a few seconds for me oh, to answer that question. That's very important. <laughs> okay. Ida B. Wills, as you guys know it, I, what do y'all know from her? Anti lynching, uh, journalist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, read, I read the plaque. Mm -hmm. We read the plaque. At a house, okay. Yeah. So, what do you know? I don't know. Did you pull it to mm. Yeah, I'm practicing. Mm -hmm. she was a reporter. Yeah, she was a very famous reporter. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, I, you can quote me on this. I actually text the mayor. Um, when, when I disagree with her, I disagree with her. She knows that I'm not on board with this nonsense, a lot of stuff. They wanted to change uh, 
what is it? What's the name of the street? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, it's the other street. Uh, the one right in front of her museum. They, uh, the same guy I'm telling you about, Mr. Mr. Five, Mr. Ten Feet. Because this person's name is on the street. Uh, Van Dorn here, when in my ancestry DNA, I found out that I'm related to Van Dorn. Mr. Ten Feet? No, no, uh, not, not Mr. Ten Feet, but he's he's related. He's tied into these three. Okay. Van Dorn is one of those Confederate generals oh, wow. that's buried in the graveyard. Wow. I that's discovered awesome. in my ancestry. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I, I discovered in my ancestry that I'm 20% Caucasian. I have a, a, a Caucasian blood disorder and an Afro-American blood disorder. Wow. And all this, 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 I've learned all this in just less than three years. So to go back to... I can't think of the name of the street, but the street right in front of her building is named after, they say, one of the founders of Holly Springs. One of the slave owners of Holly Springs. Van Dorn is one of the slave owners of Holly Springs. How did his DNA get into me? Was it by choice or was it by force? We all know that. So you go around this city, not one street is named after any black person that has uh, done anything productive in this city. So I was all for changing the name of that street in front of Ida B. Wells to Ida B. Wells Boulevard. But what they did, that Mr. Mr. Ten Feet went around to black people and manipulated their minds and convinced them that that's not the main street in Holly Springs, Ida B. Wells, it needs to be somewhere on the main street. That street is just, those are the two main streets. There's only four main streets in Holly Springs. Westbound, eastbound there and westbound there. Uh, uh, what is it? The one Memphis Street and that street that go in all the same directions. At some point through the day, you're going to end up on one of those four streets. You're going to end up on Memphis Street. Memphis Street is just a main thoroughfare from, for, um, the coming in and out because it was a highway. That was the original Highway 78. That, that's where you're going to go. You know, it comes right through Holly Springs. That's where it was before they did the expressway. So that being said, we have another gentleman that we should be actually honoring too. That's how I remember him. The first black senator. His picture is in City Hall. Why not erase two birds with one stone? Why not name Memphis Street Hiram Rebel Boulevard, a Hiram Rebel Street, and name that street that's named after the so-called founder of Holly Springs to Ida B. Wells that lived in the back of his house uh, as a slave. Her family was a slave under his tenure. If we're going to do it, do it right. Ida B. Wells Street in front of her building, Ida B. Wells Park behind her building. That's how you do it. You don't, you don't, I'm not taking away from those people. They did what they did and they are who they are and that's history. And, but if you never change it, you, you're doomed to repeat it. Did you brought that up? Hmm? Did you brought that up yeah. during the meetings mm -hmm. and wow. shut down? No. Yeah, so there, <laughs> there, was a lot, there was a lot of arguing between, okay. the, that's what I'm saying, they're divided. Uh, the the African-American community is divided. You got some big voices that, in my opinion, I think, and then those voices go get into the ear of a couple of people and manipulate them into thinking, oh, well, yeah, Memphis Street is a main street. Can yeah. I just ask real quick, what, what possible attachment could there be to Van Dorn Street? Like, what? The same attachment to, to these buildings? So it's like, but from like a city perspective of changing things, why could they possibly, like, why do they still hold on to it, you know? They're not. They're being manipulated. That's what I'm saying. That it, they be being manipulated and him hard with, and not knowing what's really going on. They divide. If, they, if you divide the black race here, the black race is divided by the small majority of Caucasian that live here. They divide it, and they because I don't take what a Caucasian tells me at face value. I question it. I don't disagree with it. I argue with it. Like I said, I didn't argue with him when he was telling me about uh, we should be. I'm not arguing with you. I already know the answer to that. Why am I going to argue with you, run my blood pressure up, and we still going to have, you going to have the same mindset? I'm going to have the same mindset. But the people that I want to see grow, 
I want to change their mindset. You already got it. They have nothing. At our best, we all just feel the rag. They, if I say this, they, he think he's something. I don't think I'm nothing. I just know what I know. And I want to see what I want to see that I put my children in for every other child in this community, white, black, or indifferent. I think children are the place where we need to be focused on. Because when I get old, who in this city do I want taking care of me? Right now? Mm-mm. I'm going somewhere else. Well, with that said, uh, thank you very much. That will conclude the interview for today. It was a pleasure, uh, uh, Reverend, being here today uh, with us, spending some time and give, enlightening us a little bit about the history and your family's history. And mm -hmm. it's been a pleasure being here today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You walk in, I've never seen a museum. This is this, if you want, he's got all, everything in there, just like you. What do you mean? You go in, you're quiet.